uh, which should have been around page 152, 153, I hope. Um, we're introduced to a couple of characters that Hanno Hath is with as he's off on his... Um, I don't remember what this is called, kind of the preparation for his remedial exams, let's say. Um, and we meet Miko, I don't know how you pronounce his last name, Mimeleth, a tailor, okay? And we find out he's 47 years old, or he will be, etc. And he sat the high exam 25 times. It's always the same. Okay, and remember, you do the high exam once a year. So he's done this 25 times and the implication is he's failed. He hasn't done well enough to move on as it were. So they keep talking and a young man says, page 152, um, if they'd only ask me about butterflies, I could tell them a thing or two. And a third man says, or cloud formations. And then the young man who was talking earlier says, I know every butterfly that's ever been seen in Aramanth, and one that's not been seen for 30 years and more. And the third man says, ask me a question about clouds. Give me the wind strength, the wind direction, and the air temperature, and I'll tell you where the rain will fall and when. Miko Mamilla says, what I'd like is questions about fabrics, fine cotton, cool linen, warm wool tweeds, I know them all. What's the point of this little discussion? That is, why is what each one of them is saying significant or important? What are they asking to be tested over? On their strengths. Okay, on their strengths, but what else? Follow that up. I mean, um, why are these strengths important or significant for them? It's their life. It's what they're able to do. In other words, they're suggesting the testing should be what? Okay, keep going. I'm, I'm looking for one word in particular. And it's a word some of you will use or have used, probably use when you're not around this class, you know, about what goes on in this class or what goes on in a lot of your, you know, core or gen ed courses. What is its relevance? What's its relevance? Okay. Notice each one of the things they're talking about is very relevant to their lives. Miko, who is a tailor, we're told all he needs to do is touch a piece of fabric and he with his eyes closed and he could tell you what it is. Okay. The guy with the clouds can do what? Tell, yeah, tell you where the rain is going to fall. Tell you when it's going to fall. Okay. Hanno Half looked from one to the other, saw how the dull, listless, listless look had gone from their eyes, and how they held their heads high and butted in on each other in their eagerness to speak. Okay. They're no longer, as we're told, dull and listless. What does it mean to be listless? To have no interest. To have no direction. To have no purpose. Okay? Each of these individuals suddenly is full of purpose. Why? Because they're talking about <clears throat> things that they value, things that they know, things that are important to them and to their livelihoods, it appears. So the cloud guy says, wouldn't it be wonderful or wouldn't it be grand if we could be tested on what we really know? Wouldn't you like to have tests like that? I mean, I'll admit, this kind of course, maybe 80% of what you read, you don't like. But maybe there's 20% that you do which is why I try to create the exams in such a way, hopefully, something on those exams 
strikes a chord, as it were. Okay? Hanno, maybe we should be. And they're like, what? So Hanno goes off. He has a meeting with the principal. And he finds out um, that the children were seen entering the under lake yesterday around noon. And they haven't been seen since. And Hanno just thinks, there was daylight. That is, there's an exit from the lake. And he thinks, keep them safe. As if there was someone or something out there to whom he could appeal. They're so young. Watch over them. Okay? Look at that passage again. Keep them safe, he said as if there was someone or something out there to whom he could appeal. What does the as if imply? It's a subjunctive phrase, okay? A subjunctive means it's a condition contrary to fact. So, as if there was someone or something out there to whom he could appeal, is actually implying there isn't. Someone or something, please, God. Okay. Watch over them. Chapter 14, Return of the Old Children. We're going to see that kind of language, as if there was someone or something out there that could watch over them, a couple of times in this novel. It gets used more in the second one, and then even more in the third. I think I've mentioned in here... Take that back, I don't think I did. Um, William Nicholson... On his website, uh, where he talks about himself a little bit, he says that at one point in his life, I think when he was in university, he was a really strong Catholic. I mean, strong Catholic to where he was arguing the Catholic faith to others. And I don't remember what happened, but sometime in his 30s, he lost his faith. He now cons considers himself, I don't think he considers himself an atheist. I think he says he's agnostic, Okay. Agnostic meaning, I don't know. I don't know if there's a God or not. Okay? Every one of his books, however, or of his young adult novels, let's say, kind of makes it clear this is someone who wants to believe. But he can't. That is, because he doesn't believe in Catholicism, in Christianity anymore, Okay. It leaves a big gaping hole. But he wants to. That is, he really wants there to be a God. He really wants there to be a Jesus. But he doesn't believe it. So, what kind of position does that put him in? He wants to believe, but he can't. And yet every one of his novels, at least the young adult, the novels for young adults, presents this belief, not this, I want to believe, but I can't, but this real belief that there is something out there. This, this other series, I think, that I've mentioned, the um, No Man, N-O-M-A-N, one word series. I, I don't think that's the ex exact title. It's something like that. Um, actually, has a guy who's, who's like an old 6th, 7th century Christian monk from the desert. You can read about these guys in Lives of the Desert Fathers and stuff. You know, people who are found praying, and as they're praying, they're like 12, 24 inches off the ground. Some of them sitting, some of them standing, and, and they're levitating, according to eyewitness accounts. Well, he's got characters like that in his other novels. Okay, back to um, chapter 14. We're going to skip a bunch. Um, they find the old battered 
uh, wind sailor, the craft, and on page 168, they're in the middle of, a, of this kind of desert, okay? And we're told um, the mountains were nearer, but still many days walk away. They had enough food left to last them for perhaps one more day, if they were careful. What after that? Kestrel says, we go on. Something will happen. Notice this. This is blind faith. Something will happen. Something will take care of us. She doesn't know what. Okay. Turn over to the next page. Um, we find out Mumpo's hungry, but he's eaten all of his mud nuts. Cass and Bo still have some, but you know, they've got to last for them. Page 169. Cass tells Bo, we've got a, uh, tells Mumpo, we've got a long way to go, you know. No, I don't. I don't know where we're going. Why is Mumpo along? To follow Kess. Notice, Kess knows what the ultimate goal is. Find the voice for the wind singer. Does Mumpo know anything about that? Have they told him? In no. He doesn't know what that's about at all. And it was true. They had never taken the time to, de to tell him. Bowman suddenly felt ashamed. Why hadn't they taken the time to tell him? Okay, what does that mean? Because he's Mumpo. <laughs> He's a loser. He's stupid. I mean, he saved their life, you know. So, Bo says, show him the map, Kess. She unrolls the map and explains it. And when she finishes, he says, are you afraid, Kess? Yes. I'll help you. I'm not afraid. Why aren't you afraid, Mumbo? Asks Bowman. This is an important little scene. What is there to be afraid of? Here we are, the three friends. The storm's gone away. We've had our supper. Everything's all right. What does Mumpo mean? How does Mumpo live? Put it that way. Moment by moment. Moment by moment. He lives in the moment. Notice, the storm's gone away. That's past. We've had our dinner. It's in the past. He doesn't think about tomorrow. Christ said, take no thought for the morrow. Why? There are enough evils of today. <laughs> okay? But don't you worry about what might happen to us later? Mumpo, how can I? I don't know what's going to happen until it happens. That is, how can I worry about what's going to happen later? I don't know what's going to happen until it happens. I think Nicholson there has in mind the words of Socrates to his followers the night before he commits suicide. Well, you could call it committing suicide or you could call it fulfilling the law of Athens at the time. If you know the story or if you don't know the story, Socrates was brought up on trumped-up charges okay, to the Senate of Athens. The trumped-up charges were, one, he was an atheist. Two, he was leading the men of the young people of Athens astray. Okay? And he, he was allowed a defense. He got to defend himself, essentially, in court. And he said, you say I'm leading the young people of Athens astray because I'm causing them to ask questions. You know, you see the bumper stickers, question authority. Socrates is the origin of that, essentially. Okay? The people of Athens, the senators of Athens, didn't want their authority questioned. Okay? So he says, essentially, his defense is, asking questions isn't a damnable or a capital offense. And they agree with him on that. Okay? Essentially. He also says some of the reasons for these charges are some of these senators are jealous of me and afraid of me. And he shows why. 
about the charge of atheism, he says, how can you say I'm an atheist? An atheist says, there is no God or there are no gods. He says, what I'm saying is that this belief in Jupiter, Hera, Hephaestus, Apollo, this is ludicrous. All of these gods in our Greek pantheon are nothing but elevated people. Why? Look how they behave. Look at Jupiter. He sleeps with anything that moves. He's full of jealousy. He's full of rage. He's full of anger. And he says, the divine nature is not like that. So, by saying the divine nature, what's he saying? I believe in divinity. I just don't believe it's anything like what we say it is. Okay? And he essentially comes around to saying, I believe God is one. That is, monotheistic. But we don't really know what he is like. Okay? So, the Senate finds him guilty and says, you have to kill yourself. You have to drink the hemlock. Okay? Their version of, you know, the electric chair, as it were. So the night before he drinks it, he's in his prison cell, and Plato and his, Socrates' other followers, come to him. And they say, we bribed a guard. The guard's going to let you out. You can leave Athens. Okay? And Socrates says, and this is kind of standard Greek thought, if I leave Athens, where am I going to go? Athens is everything to an Athenian. That is, if you're an Athenian and you leave Athens, it's, it's like leaving life. Your whole identity is wrapped up in Athens. Okay? So he essentially says, if I leave Athens, I go off into the wildness, to the barbarians, essentially, and become less than I am, less than human. He says, no. And they're like, but you're going to die. Aren't you afraid of that? And Socrates is like, why should I be afraid of death? Now think of that question. Why should one fear death? Why does Lord Voldemort fear death? Hamlet says in his To Be or Not To Be speech that death is that undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns. And it's because it's undiscovered and because you don't know what it is. That's what stops people from committing suicide. Okay. Socrates' point he comes around to make is you guys have been with me for so long and you still don't understand what is it we fear? Anybody? What's a fear you have? Yeah, no. Not knowing. Socrates says that's illogical. Think about it. Why do you fear something you don't know? Shouldn't you fear something you do know? We can control it if we know it. Okay, we or, could, or at least attempt to. Or you can attempt to control it if you know it. Do you fear walking out that door at the end of class? Why not? Because you know where you're going to go. Do you? For the most. Well, you know your next your class schedule, so you know. We can okay, you know your class schedule, but all of that's in the future. Do you know the future? No. I mean, really pause and think seriously about this for a moment. Think back four or five years ago, Virginia Tech. <laughs> Student wakes up one morning. Well, not one morning. He'd been planning it, you know. Goes off, not half cocked, goes off whole cocked. Kills 32 students. Every one of those students, when they were in class that morning, thought, I know my class schedule, I'm going to go to my next class. Didn't happen. Did they walk into class that morning fearing 
what was going to happen 20 minutes later? No. Okay. So why do we fear the unknown? If we really feared the unknown, how many of us would get up out of bed every morning? You, you wouldn't. Okay. Because people die every day in their homes. You're taking a shower. You slip. You fall. You hit your head. Bam. You're dead. You get in your car, you head off to work, bam, a semi, runs a red light, smacks right into you. You cut somebody off, wrong person to cut off, because the person is dealing with all kinds of crap in their life, and they're locked and loaded. And you get road rage. Okay? So Socrates' point is, we should fear what we know. Well, what is it that we know? We've seen things happen, okay? You should fear maybe the person in the car next to you. Or the person that you know doesn't like you, etc. But we shouldn't fear death. Why? As Hamlet says, we don't know what death is. We don't know... What is beyond that doorway? Which is why Dumbledore, because I think Dumbledore is kind of channeling a little bit Socrates here, which is why Dumbledore says at the end of that first Harry Potter book, to the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. Socrates didn't think death was the end of existence. He said it's just another kind of existence. We don't know what kind. Okay? Mumpo, how can I fear what might come later? I don't know what's going to happen until it happens. Bowman looks at Mumpo curiously. Maybe he wasn't so stupid after all. Maybe Mumpo is what's called a natural philosopher. That is, not someone who goes and reads and studies books but someone who just kind of is naturally in touch with the world. And they hear the sound of Ambaraka coming. Okay? They get captured by Ambaraka, and there's going to be a battle between Ambaraka and Amchaka. Okay? And they talk the guard into leaving them essentially untied when they get put on their little ship. And they defeat Amchaka. I'm skipping a lot of this. Okay. And go on to chapter 17. The Hath family fights back. Pinpin asks, We're Bo, we're Kess. And Ira Hath does what? She takes what clothes and fabric she has, the bedspread. And she makes robes for herself and Pin Pin. What do the robes look like? They are robes of many colors. In other words, what part of the city do they live in? What district? Gray district. So, they're supposed to dress in gray. What is she doing? She's rebelling against the system. What colors is she wearing? It's implied all of, and uh, all colors, gray, orange, maroon, uh, scarlet, white. In other words, tell with your rigid stratification, okay, of society. And so she takes a lunch basket and pin pin, and walks on along. She goes down to the wind singer. Page 222. She goes down to the wind singer, and Dr. Grease comes out, and he says, this is not a circus, you are not a clown. You will come down from there. And she says, no, I won't. She rises to her full height and cries in her most prophetic voice, oh, unhappy people. Watch now and see that there is no freedom 
in Aramanth. And he's like, no freedom in Aramanth. What are you talking about? And she says, I am Ira Hath, direct descendant of the prophet Ira Manth, and I've come to prophesy to the people. Notice the name, Ira Manth, how similar it is to Ira Manth. And Dr. Greeth says, Madam, you are speaking nonsense. You are fortunate enough to live in the only truly free society that has ever existed. In Aramanth, every man and woman is born equal and has an equal chance to rise to the very highest position. There is no poverty here or crime or war. We have no need of profits. Is there any poverty? Yeah, where? Gray district. gray district. And the closer you get to gray district, is there inequality? How about the white district? As opposed to the gray district. Okay. But for Dr. Greef and those who follow the laws of Aramath, why is that not inequality? You get what you deserve. You get what you work for. Okay. Thomas Jefferson rightly said, all men are created equal. Does that therefore mean, like Bernie Sanders suggests, that all men should have equal wealth? What does it mean, all men are created equal? It means ontologically. In the eyes of God, all people are equal. Does everybody in this room have the same IQ? No. Does everyone in this room have the same work ethic? No. Okay. Does everyone in this room have the same ideas? No. We're all born different. We're all born in our own bodies, to our own families, to a certain socioeconomic situation, etc. Some of us are born, in terms of those external things, more advantaged than others. Okay. Look at our, you know, look at the Republican presidential candidates. Who was born of those, let's say the major ones? Trump, Carson, Cruz, Rubio, Christie, and Fiorina. Let's say among those six. Who among those six was born to the worst advantage? If you know their stories at all. Ben Carson. Single mother, 11 children, his mother couldn't read. In inner city Detroit. Okay. He almost killed a man when he was 14. Friend, he almost killed. And his mother turned him around. Okay. Donald Trump was born in the proverbial lap of luxury. I mean, he had everything. He made a comment the other day about, you know, he, he hasn't necessarily had it so easy. You know, he had to borrow a million dollars from his dad to, to start his first business. Yeah, I'm like, I, I wish I could borrow 10 grand from my parents, you know. Five grand would be nice. Okay. Yeah, exactly. You got 20? All right. <laughs> All you have to do is look at this because there ain't nothing there. <laughs> okay? So, the point is, what has Carson done? Okay? He learned to read and he started to read an awful lot. He put himself through college. He put himself through med school. And he became the number one pediatric neurosurgeon in the world. The first person to separate Siamese twins conjoined at the head. And he was like 32 or 34 when he did that. Okay. So what's that, what's that mean? Where's the equality in how he was born versus what he became. Okay. Equality is equality of opportunity. Do they have here equal opportunity? Not really. Why not? 
They say they do. Do they have freedom? Do we have freedom? Now, Nicholson isn't, isn't trying to describe, I don't think, a particular society in Aramath. But I think he is suggesting some aspects of Western society. You know, the United States and Great Britain kind of consider themselves the epitome of Western civilization and the freedom that it aspires to. Okay? He wrote this in 2000 where it was published in 2000. There's a big difference between the United Kingdom and the United States. Okay. Even in the year 2000, which was 15 years ago, a um, lot less freedom in Great Britain. And in the intervening 15 years, you'd be amazed at how much less freedom there is. For example, can you say whatever you want in the United States on Twitter? To an extent. What do you mean to an extent? I mean, you can't say you're going to kill the president. Yeah. Okay, you can't say that. Why can't you say that? That's a threat to the president. Okay. The Supreme Court has ruled that's essentially called fighting words. Okay. You can't make a specific threat to a specific individual. Can you say, I want to kill all Native Americans? Yes, you can. You can. Because that's not a specific threat to a specific individual. Okay? That is protected speech. Contrary to what a lot of people think, the First Amendment doesn't have any kind of carve-out for hate speech. The First Amendment protects all speech, except for a specific, direct threat to an individual, more clearly, to their face, okay, and a threat to the president or a member of government, in that kind of sense, or something like shouting fire in an auditorium, because what does that do? It creates chaos and panic, okay, you can't incite a riot, in other words, okay, but you can say thoroughly hateful and derogatory things about people. I mean, you can very easily say all kinds of horrible stuff if you want to do about President Obama. You could use all kinds of racial epithets about President Obama. You could call President Obama not just a closet, quasi-soft socialist. You could say he's a diet-in-the-world Marxist communist. And you won't get in trouble. But if you move to Great Britain, if you move to England, and you say something like that, you'll get arrested. You will get arrested. If you use Twitter to make a racially insensitive comment, not even necessarily directed to an individual, but directed to a class of people, and the race doesn't matter. Well, I'll take that back. Yeah, it does. Today, if it's specifically racially insensitive towards people of Middle Eastern descent, okay, or people who are Muslim, you'll get arrested, okay, because that kind of language is not allowed. If you post something on Facebook, Again, in England, you'll get arrested. You'll be charged. There's actually been cases of soccer players okay, who have been banned from games, not by the government, but by FIFA, okay, Federal, uh, Federation of International Football Associations, because a player has made a racially derogatory comment about another player. You stupid nigger kind of a thing. And have also then come under the trouble with the law. Okay? So I think Nicholson is raising questions about UK society in terms of um, how he portrays 
Aramath. Notice, Dr. Grief goes on and says, you're fortunate enough to, enough to live in the only truly free society that has ever existed. In Aramanth, every man and woman is born equal. Mumpo? And has an equal chance to rise to the very highest position. There is no poverty here or crime or war. We have no need of prophets. What do prophets do? They think outside the box. They think outside the box? Okay. What else? What do prophets say? Prophecies. Okay, what's a prophecy? A prediction of the future. Okay, it can be a prediction of the future. A foretelling. Usually it comes to pass. Well, if they're a real prophet, yeah. use a biblical example. If you're a real prophet in the Old Testament, every prophecy you utter has to be true. That is, it must come to pass. You utter a thousand prophecies, and 999 are right and one is wrong. You're not a true prophet. Okay? What else do they do? They don't only foretell, they forthtell. That is, use a modern phrase, they speak truth to power. They speak the truth. Not necessarily about something 20 years from now. Right now. Okay? Notice. We have no need of prophets, and yet you fear me. What's your point? <laughs> exactly. You're afraid of what I have to say. If everything he said is true, should they fear anybody saying anything negative about society? Uh, you're mistaken, madam. We don't fear you, but we find you a little noisy. Okay. Um, page 224 at the bottom. Principal Pillish notices that the candidates are helping each other prepare for their exams. And he asks Hanno, what's your secret? And Hanno says, we have the time here to think about the real value of examinations. Notice the language, how it can be read or interpreted in a way different than the principal understands. We've realized that what an examination does is test the best in us. So if we give it our best, well, whatever the result, we should be content to be judged by it. Hanno means the best in us, what we know the best. The other guy's thinking, they're giving it their all. They're going to do their best. Okay. So, bottom of the page. We're told the high exam contained over 100 questions. Ignore the questions on paper, Hanno says. Write about what you know best. Give them your best. But they'll just fail us. They'll fail us anyway even if we try to answer their questions. They all nod. Hanno, so what's the point? It's like giving tests and flying to fish. Let's each of us do what we're good at. They'll hate it. Let them. Do you want to sit in that arena and feel sick with panic for another four hours? They say no. So they're going to do what they knew. Top of the next page. 227. In their exercises, they practiced writing papers on subjects of their own choosing. Monographs were in preparation on drainage systems, on growing cabbages, on rope jumping games. Miko Mimeleth was working on the definitive classification of woolen weaves. Hanno Hath was tackling some problems in Old Man's script. Go to 230, towards the end of the chapter. Ira Hath. People are saying, prophesy, prophesy. So she prophesies. Oh, unhappy people. No poverty, no crime, no war, no kindness. No poverty, no crime, no war. Wouldn't most people say, well, that would be like utopia? That would be a perfect society? 
no kindness. I think she's, by putting them in this order, she's saying, if you have no poverty and you have no crime and you have no war, you will also have no kindness. Why? Need bad to be good, Do you need bad to be good? Must there be evil in order for there to be good? So it's like a yin-yang. Maybe. Classically, you know, in terms of philosophy or, or theology, evil doesn't have an existence. Evil isn't a thing. Evil is the absence of something. It's the lack of something. Like dark is the absence of light. Okay? So evil is the negation or the perversion of something that exists and that is good. No poverty, no crime, no war, no kindness. She kind of seems to be implying that poverty, war, and crime give us opportunities for what? Right. To show kindness. I, I just, before class, my daughter posted something on Facebook about a Georgia Highway Patrolman. Halloween night, gets a call, two young parents go out to get more face paint and stuff for their children for Halloween for their costumes. They run off the road a mile away from their house and die. Four young children, ages 6 to 13, left at home. They don't know what happened to their parents. The cop gets the call, the highway patrolman gets the call, and he's like, there's no way. I'm going to take these kids in so that they are going to have to sleep in a jail cell tonight, which is what would have happened. Nearest relative is grandparents in South Florida. So he takes the kids. He doesn't tell them what happened to their parents. Don't, I don't understand how the kids don't ask, but he takes the kids. They go out for dinner. He takes them out for burger and fries. Takes them back to the police station. Meanwhile, or to the patrol station. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, other patrolmen <laughs> have gotten in on the act. One guy and his wife bring their son and a bunch of videos up to the patrol station. Neighbors of the family had been informed, and they start bringing in literally bags of candy so that the kids have an all-night slumber party, essentially, at the patrol station. And while that's going on, their grandparents are making the drive up from South Florida so that the next morning, the grandparents are the ones to explain what happened. Not only that, the cop starts a GoFundMe campaign to pay for the funerals of the parents. Okay? That's kindness. <laughs> Nobody said he had to do that. Is that part of his job? Hell no. <laughs> This wasn't funny at all. The people in the crowd shuffled their feet and avoided each other's eyes. Then for a third time, she says, Oh, unhappy people, I hear your hearts crying for want of kindness. Want of, for lack of kindness. What kind of kindness was she shown when she, was she, shown when she left house that morning? What did people say? You can't do that. What kind of kindness was she shown when they were kicked out of Orange District and down to Gray? None. In fact, the person who was moving into her home said, can you please leave so I can get my stuff in? But there wasn't any, I'm so sorry this has happened to you. Ira Hath knew that she had proved herself a true prophetess because none could bear to hear her speak. What is she doing? Okay, but what effect is that having on people? They're not liking it. Keep going. They're realizing their lives are a lie. Why is it, again, I'm going to go back to politics for a minute. Why is it 
Two people who have never held elected office of any kind are one and two on the Republican side. What characterizes the kinds of stuff Ben Carson and Donald Trump say? They say what they think. Do they say what they think the media wants to hear? Do they say what they think Washington wants to hear? No. They've thrown what's called political correctness out the window. They say what they think people need to, whether you agree with them or not, doesn't matter. It's they're saying what they think people need to hear. What do politicians usually say? What they think we want to hear, which is what usually gets them in trouble, because then they'll get recorded saying what they really think somewhere else, and that hits the radio or the TV screen or YouTube. Yeah, you know, George W. George H. W. Bush in 1992. Well, take that back, 1988, had as a central part of his campaign, I mean, he said this at the Republican National Convention, read my lips, no new taxes. And then in 1990, he works out a deal with the Democrats, and he raises taxes. Okay. The whole thing about, you know, the, the recent turmoil in the House of Representatives, Okay, um, about whether or not Paul Ryan would be, I'm a news junkie, politics junkie, about whether or not Paul Ryan would be elected. Paul Ryan has always been for increased immigration. He thinks we ought to take the 11, 12 million illegals that are in the country, I'm going to use a politically insensitive term, the illegals that are in the country, and ought to offer them a pathway to citizenship. You're not going to notwithstanding what Donald Trump says, you're not going to be able to deport 12 million people and then get them to come back legally. Okay? That made an awful lot of real conservative members of the House leery about electing him Speaker of the House. So what did he do just the other day? He said both in a... No, you didn't change. He said both in a speech... And then in an article, I think for the Wall Street Journal or USA Today, I can't remember which, he said, as long as President Obama is president, we will not do any kind of comprehensive immigration reform, which is what he wants to do. That is Paul Ryan. Why won't he do it? Because he said, President Obama has proven, proven himself untrustworthy. Why? Because of executive orders regarding amnesty. With the wave of a pen, makes five million of those twelve million illegals legal, without any law behind that. Okay, so he's he's done that. Look at what presidents do when they run for office. I'm going to cut the deficit. Obama promised to cut the deficit. What's happened to the deficit? What's happened to the debt? The debt's gone up from, I think it was $7 million when Bush left office, Bush 2 left office. It's $17 trillion now. No, it's $18 trillion because it's gone up $11 trillion. More than all the other presidents combined. Okay? And yet he said... We'll cut the deficit, and we'll cut the debt. It's been exactly the opposite. Crack in the land. Next chapter. i got to go more quickly. Um, they make their way on forward. Page 236. They start to talk to Mumpo. And Mumpo's like, um, they're, they're like, they ask him, Mumpo, what happened to your father and mother? He says, my mother died when I was little. I haven't got a father. Did he die too? I don't know. I just, I just haven't got one. Everyone's got a father. Unless you're Darth Vader. 
right? Anakin Skywalker. Darth Vader, the two words mean Darth Lack, spelled D-E-A-R-T-H. Vader, it's Dutch for father, Lack father. Okay? Everyone's got a father. I haven't. You want to know what happened to him? No. Why not? Just don't. Bowman, so how can you have a family rating? Kess, how can you even go to school in the Orange District? Even though and she catches Bowman's glance and she stops. Mumpo, even though I'm so stupid, <laughs> he knows what she was going to say. Uh, I've got an uncle. It's because of my uncle that I go to school in Orange District, even though I'm so stupid. Bowman felt a wave of sadness pass through him, and he shuddered as if it were his own. Do you hate school, Mumpo? Oh, yes. I don't understand anything, and I'm always alone, so I'm always unhappy. The twins looked at him and remembered how they had laughed at him along with the others, and they felt ashamed. What is it Ira Hath was just saying to the people of Araminth? No kindness. What are Bo and Kestrel learning? Mm -hmm. But it's all right now, Mumpo says. I've got a friend now, haven't I, Kess? Kess, yes, I'm your friend. Notice, wipe your nose. Nope. Get away from me. Nope. Love you, Kess. Who's your uncle, Mumpo? I don't know. Never seen him. He's got a very high rating. But I'm stupid, you see, so he doesn't want me in his family. But that's horrible. Oh, no, he's very good to me. Mrs. Cherish always, is always telling me so. Only if I was in his family, it would make his family rating much lower. So because Mumpo's so stupid, he has Mumpo raised by somebody else so that he doesn't bring down their family. Kestrel, Mumpo, what a bad, sad place Aramant has become. Do you think so? I thought I was. I thought only I thought that. We're told here by Mumpo he's always thought Araminth was a bad, sad place. Did Kess? No. Bowman wondered, wondered at Mumpo. The more he knew of him, the more in a strange way he admired him. There seemed to be no malice in him. Or vanity. What's malice? Hatred. Evil. Okay? So there's none of that in him, and there's no vanity either. Well, obviously there's no vanity, because he's stupid, right? He goes on. He accepted what each moment brought him and never troubled himself with matters that were outside his control. What does that mean? He accepted what each moment brought him. Yeah, notice. Notice, it's acceptance. It's not resignation. Okay? It's kind of like at the end of Fantasties, when Anodos is thinking, and he's thinking everything that comes to him, is what? Good. It's good. It's just he has to learn to understand how it's good. Even the evil that comes to him, he says, is the good that is coming in only the way it can come. He never troubled himself with matters that were outside his control. Why? Why didn't he trouble himself with matters outside his control? And this is the danger of this thing. You get on the internet and you read about stuff that happens around the world. And yet, what can you do about it? Nothing. Okay. What can he do about matters outside his control? Absolutely nothing. So... He doesn't worry about them. Despite the unhappiness of his lonely life, he seemed to have been born incurably good-hearted. 
or perhaps the one had somehow led to the other. That is, perhaps the unhappiness of his lonely life made him good-hearted, and the many cruelties he had known had taught him to be grateful for even the smallest kindnesses. Okay? Inter interesting portrayal. Very similar, by the way, to how Harry Potter is portrayed. Born to a harsh life, in terms of after his parents are murdered, raised by harsh people, and yet he never responds in kind to anybody. That is, if somebody slaps him, he doesn't respond in kind. Usually. Every now and then. Okay? Go on. Um... They're being followed by the old children, and they're on the bridge, page 250. They're on the little bridge over cracking the land. And they're going to go to sleep on the bridge, page 250. Mumpo says, there's no room to sleep. We're not going to sleep. Not sleep? To Mumpo, sleeping was as necessary and as unavoidable as eating. He's bewildered. How could he not sleep? Sleep wasn't something you chose. Sleep came upon you. The twins knew this as well as Mumpo. Come on, Mumpo, says Bowman. We'll sit either side of you. And if you want to sleep, you can. Notice the image. They'll sit either side. But it's not like their backs are to Mumpo. How do they sleep? Mm -hmm. Arms around him. Right? And he's in the middle, like a wish huddle. Okay? But the arms around show what? Love, care, protection. Okay? To hold him in a double hug just like a wish huddle. That way if he fell asleep, they could stop him from rolling off the wall. What else could it do? Mumble's bigger than both of them. Bring them on in. All for one and one for all. We're the three friends, Mumpo says, top of the next page. So great was his trust that he actually did fall asleep, sitting on two feet of stone wall, balanced half a mile above the granite gorge. Not what I would do. Okay. Mumpo goes wrong, next chapter. We're going to skip a bunch. Page 264, 265. Okay. They're being followed by the eagles and the wolves. The eagles take the last of their mud nuts. Okay. Bowman has a ripped, has a gash in his hand from the eagle that took the mud nut out of his hand. And he sees the leader of the pack, the old gray wolf. And somehow Bowman knows exactly what needs to be done. He holds his hand out. Okay. And the wolf comes forward, bottom of 264. Then his long, shaggy body rippled, and he sank down onto his haunches, and from there into a prone position. He laid his head on his outstretched paws, and his eyes gazed steadily at Bowman. The other wolves followed their leader's example. They all lay down. Bowman then realized he knew what it was he must do. He held out his bleeding hand, and the father of the wolves lifted his gray muzzle and smelled it, and licked away the blood. What are they thinking before this? The wolves smell the blood. Like blood in the water? Yeah, they're coming to kill us. Bowman sits down. The wolf rests his head in his lap. It looks up. And Bowman says, they've been waiting for us. What for? To fight the Mora. Okay. And the eagles also. And the eagles start to land. And he hears from the eagles, as it were, we have waited a long time. Now we will face the ancient enemy at last. So they go off. Mumpo's been touched by the old children. And they go through the fire and into the fire. And they go into the room, the bedroom, where the old lady is asleep on the big bed. And Bo sees in her hair the voice of the wincing. Bottom of 276, there is a silver clasp in the shape of a curled over letter S. 
And she, Kess says to Bo's mind, can you get it? He says, I'll try. All right. He takes it. Kestrel takes it from him. But Bo's eyes are on the old lady. And she wakes up and looks into his eyes. And he looks into hers. And what does he see? Page 278. He saw them change. In her eyes, there were other eyes. Many eyes. Hundreds of eyes. Staring back at him. The eyes drew him in. And in each, he saw more eyes and more. We are the Mora, said the million eyes to him. We are legion. We are all. There now, not afraid anymore. What happens to Bo as a result of looking into the eyes? He becomes one of the Mora, the Legion. Okay? And the Tsars come out. And we're going to steal a bunch. We have the March of the Tsars. And Kess is willing to let Bo kill her as long as they die together, bottom of 284 and 285. But it's her thinking to him, we will die together, that he finally brings him out of the spell. Okay? Page 289. They see Mumpo. Mumpo is one of the czars, dressed in the white marching band outfit. Okay? And Mumpo says they're his friends. And there's millions of them. Page 289. Bo, listen to me, Mumpo. The czars aren't your friends. They're your enemies. We're your friends. And he says to him, I know what it feels like, Mumpo. I felt it too. What's the it? It feels like you're not alone and afraid anymore. Like no one can ever hurt you again. What does he mean? Awful lot of literature of the 20th century is about this idea of alienation and isolation. <clears throat> it's called existential liter literature. That we are all locked up in our own little boxes. And what we want more than anything else is to feel connected to somebody else. And it's not about sex. It's to feel an emotional or a spiritual connection. That's what Bo's talking about here. He says, I felt it too, Mumpo. What did Mumpo say before? I never had any friends. Now I do. You and Kess. Yes, that's right, Bo. Notice what Bowman says. We can't give you that feeling. We can't make you feel connected. But we've stood by you and you've stood by us. Don't leave us now. Am I to be alone and afraid again? And that is, am I to be cut off? Meaning, an individual? Yes, Mumpo. I wish I could tell you we'll keep you safe, but I can't. Why does he say that? Top of 290. Because the Mora are like God. As long as you're a member of the Mora, you're one of the czars, you can't be harmed. It's this whole collective idea. And Bo is saying, we're, we're not a collective. We are your friends. We will stand with you, but we can't protect you. We can't save you. We're not as strong as you are. And Mumpo says, you are my first friends. I'll never leave you. And they hug each other, and they go on. And we see the battle between the wolves and the eagles and the czars. And the czars keep going. They destroy the bridge, and the jar czars keep going until they fill the ravine with czar bodies and walk across it. Chapter 22, Hath Family Broken. We find out, or Mr. Pillish finds out, how the examinees are preparing for their exams. He tells Maslow Hinch, Inch, and Maslow takes Ira Hath and Hanno Hath and takes Pin Pin away from them. Puts Pin Pin in essentially protective custody. 
and tells them, tomorrow you're going to read these statements to the entire city. And we see their statements on page 312. And the statements are essentially, I was wrong. I accept my responsibility. Aramanth is the greatest place on earth, or whatever they call the planet. And I am ashamed, and I will do better in the future. Okay. Chapter 23, The Scourge of the Plains. They then get captured by Amchaka. Okay. And they hear the Tsars, and the Amchakians let them go. And page 328, just before the last high examination. They're outside the walls of Aramanth. Bowman's got the, the voice on a string around his neck, and it's up against his skin. And we're told, top of 328, Bowman felt the silver voice of the wind singer still hanging around his neck. And he thought how close they'd come to death. And it seemed to him that someone or something must be looking after them. Someone or something wanted them to make their way home. So who or what it might be, he had no idea. Okay. And they start to run. Chapter 24, page 330. It's the high examination. The oath of dedication, page 330. I vow to strive harder, to reach higher, and in every way to seek to make tomorrow better than today. Again, in and of itself, that's a good philosophy. To make tomorrow a better day than today. For love of my emperor and for the glory of Aramith. All right. And We have the candidates, the examinees, sitting down and getting ready. And Maslow Inch is there, and he's looking at all of them, and he's thinking to himself, page 331, why is it, he thought, that some people never learn? All it takes is a little effort, a little extra push. Well, why don't they just try, as it were? Okay. The emperor is off in his office, and the emperor starts to hear the czars. Kill, 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 kill. The children race through the city. They go down to the Windsinger, page 336. Kess is caught by one of the guards. She throws the silver voice to Mumpo. Mumpo! And threw the silver voice towards him. Maslow Inch saw it as it fell and suddenly and completely understood what was happening. He strode across, across the floor to seize it. Mumpo got there just before him. Notice, does Maslow Inch know what that is? I think so. I think he wants to stop it from happening. Give that to me, you dirty little brat, commanded the chief examiner in his most authoritative voice, seizing Mumpo in his powerful hands. But as he spoke, his eyes met Mumpo's, and something happened, and happened inside him that he couldn't control. He gave a low gasp, felt, felt a hot rush in his throat and face. What's the hot rush? It's two things, I think. Recognition and shame. You! He let go. Mumpo breaks away, climbs up the wind singer, puts the voice in. Pit bottom of 337. And the wind singer turned in the breeze and the air flowed into its big leather funnels <clears throat> and found its way down to the silver voice. Softly, the silver horns began to sing. And at the very first note, a deep vibration stopped the czars dead in their tracks. They stood as if frozen, swords raised. And all around the arena, a queer, shivery sensation ran through the people, like they all suddenly get goosebumps. The next note's higher, gentle but piercing. As the wind singer turned in the wind, the note modulated up and down over the deep humming. Then came the highest note of all, like the singing of a celestial bird, a cascade of a tumbling melody. And what happens? The marshals holding Bowman and Kestrel 
release their grip. The examinees looked at the papers on their desks in bewilderment. The families in the stands stare at each other. What do they usually do? They just look down at the examinees. Hanno gets up from his death, desk. Ira leaves the gray stands. And all the time, the song of the wind singer was reaching deeper and deeper into the people, and everything was changing. Examinees could be heard asking each other, what are we doing here? Why are they saying that? What is it like just has happened? Like a spell's been broken. Like a spell's been broken. Like they've woken up. One examinee took the papers off his desk, tore them up, threw them into the air. Soon everyone was doing it, and everyone was laughing like Pin Pin. The families start to intermingle, and there was a great mixing of colors as maroon flowed into gray and orange embraced scarlet. The emperor heard the music, opened his window, and does what? Throws away the chocolate buttons. See, the chocolate buttons are symbolic of his enslavement. And now that the wind singer has freed them, the slavery is gone. In the arena, Ira Hath moved wonderingly down the tiers through the crowd, where people were now swapping clothes. Why? Because I like orange. I like scarlet. I like gray trying out combinations of colors and laughing at the unfamiliar sight. She saw Hanno coming from the other direction, his arms outstretched. Not far away, bottom of the page, 339. Unnoticed in the confusion and the laughter of the crowd. And if this doesn't kind of give you goosebumps, there's something wrong with you. Maslow Inch made his way to Mumpo and slowly sank to his knees before him. Why does he fall to his knees? Forgive me, he said, his voice trembling. Forgive you, said Mumpo. Why? You're my son. Okay? The highest of the city. And the lowest of the city. And what happens? Okay, they're related, but what does the highest do? He humbles himself. In the Orthodox Church, my church, in the Orthodox Church, just before Great Lent starts in the springtime, on the Sunday before the Monday of Great Lent, we have a service called Forgiveness Vespers. Okay? And in this service... We go through the regular Vesper stuff, which is chanting of psalms and all this kind of stuff. And then we do this ritual where everybody lines up around the interior of the, of the church. Okay? And you go up to the person, and it might be someone who's a visitor if they stick around. And you go up to the person in front of you, and you bow, you touch the ground, and you say, forgive me a sinner for anything I've done against you. And they reply, I forgive, God forgives. And then they bow and say, forgive me a sinner for anything I've done. Now, if you're in a large church, this takes hours. I mean, if you've got 300 people and each person has to go through everybody, it takes a long, long time. That's what Hanno, excuse me, that's what Maslow is doing. He falls to his knees and says, forgive me. Why? Notice he's aware. He knew all along who Mumpo was. For a few long moments, Mumpo stared at him in astonishment. Then slyly, shyly, he held out his hand, and the chief examiner took it and pressed it to his lips. When Hanno, excuse me, when Maslow saw Mumpo earlier in the novel, what did he do? He called him a brat. Well, describe what was Mumpo's physical state at that point. 
He was filthy and smelly and his nose was runny. Father, I've got friends now. Maslow Inch began to weep. Have you, my boy? Have you, my son? Do you want to meet them? And he nods, unable to speak. Mumpo led him by the hand to where the half family stood. Kess, I have got a father after all. Maslow Inch stood before them, his head lowered, unable to meet their eyes. Why? Shame. Look after him, Mumpo, says Hanno, in his quiet voice, his arms still tied around his children. Fathers need all the help the, their children can give them. What does that sentence mean? Fathers need all the help their children can give them. Isn't it a father's job to help and protect the children? Yes, it is. So what's Hanno saying this for? He is saying fathers need their children to help them too. And I don't mean chores. I mean, fathers need children to help them be good fathers. But what else is he doing? He's saying this partly for the benefit of Maslow Inch. Doesn't Hanno have good reason to just reach out and deck him? He was going to destroy the half family. Fathers need all the help their children can give them. He is telling Maslow Inch there, we're in this together. We're both fathers. We both need help. We both don't have all the answers. The emperor passed between the double rows of pillars onto the top terrace. Notice, he comes out of his room and stood gazing at the chaotic scene in the arena. The song of the wind singer flowed on and he felt its warming, loosening power like sunshine after a long winter, like Narnia when Aslan returns. He spread his arms wide and smiled happily and called out, That's it. That's the way. A city needs to be noisy. Because what characterized Aramanth before? Quiet. Quiet? What else? I had it on the board the other day. Order. Do we see order at this point? No, people are mingling. They're pulling off clothes, putting clothes on. So what happened to the czars? They not only freeze, they die, they decompose, and their dust blows away in a matter of minutes. And they're freed from the mora. So what is the mora? What does the mora represent or stand for? How does the mora control Aramis? 